The subject of, of my message is knowing the hope, of course, and this uh, is found in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15 through 20. I'd like to read this as I plan to develop this context. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Amen. Now I'd like to say a few things at the outset about faith and hope. Uh, several of the other brethren have, have commented, and I'd like to, uh, to do likewise. There is a difference between faith, love, and hope that are considered only as scriptural concepts, and those same qualities as they are demonstrated in living by men. And if the consideration does not finally lead to a demonstration, what doth it profit, my brethren? Mm -hmm. What Amen. doth it profit, as James the Apostle would say? The concept presupposes a demonstration or something that is demonstrable. Now, I want to develop this a little bit farther. In the case of faith and hope, there was first a demonstration which led to the establishment of the concept. Now follow my reasoning here. In Genesis, now see, this is important. See, now in the case of law, there was first the concept that led finally to a demonstration. Now, I'll get to that in just a minute. But in the case of faith and hope, now for example, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, now prior to this time, you don't read anything about faith. The nearest thing you come is back there uh, in Genesis 5 or 6 where it says, Then began men to call on the name of the Lord. But you don't read anything about faith, see? Now Abraham didn't have any exhortation to believe. He didn't. He demonstrated it. See, he, as Brother Fred was speaking, he was confronted with the promises of God. Look now towards heaven and count the stars, and, and see if you're able to tell them. Now it says that, uh, now Abraham's response was that he believed in the Lord, Amen. and God counted it to him for righteousness. See, there was a demonstration before there was a, before the con a written concept. That's what, I'm, that's what I want to, and I'm going to develop this a little bit further. Now here again, in the, now with regard to hope, in Genesis chapter 22, we'll correlate this with Romans chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Now this is where, of course, Abraham was commanded by God to offer up Isaac. Take him to the hills, the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Well, Paul, in commenting on this, See, that was, this was a time of intense struggle for our father Abraham. But Paul, in commenting on this, said, against hope, he believed in hope. See, he, he was drawn, hope, here hope was demonstrated before it was, before it was exhorted. There, were no, it's, there was no e exhortation to, to hope before that. God didn't say, now hope, Abraham, hope, no. He held out the his, he held out his promises. He held he he held out his word, and 
And Abraham latched on to the faithfulness of God. See, he, it was a response to God. It was a, it was a matter of, of knowing God. This, was a, this, this actually flowed out of knowing God, both, both in the matter of faith. It was, de it was demonstrated first. There was no commandment back there that now uh, Abraham, be, I want you to believe on my, believe me now when I show you the stars. No. No, this was a response to God. And it was a response to his to his word and promise. Now, here's my point. If the demonstration preceded the written concept it proves that faith and hope are not idealistic things, but rather they are doable, and they are demonstrable in every generation. Yes. Amen. 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 The only requirement, now see, Abraham, he, had, he was not without sin. See, he wasn't a sinless man. But his heart was perfect towards God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth in order that he might show himself strong in behalf of him whose heart is perfect towards him. See, but Amen. Abraham's heart was perfect. He wasn't without sin. See, now the same is the case with you. See, now, now we want, in, see, now in every, every generation there can be, you can be the living demonstration. Amen. You don't want it just to be on the pages of the book. See, you want... When people think about hope, and when they think about faith, you want them to associate it with your name. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, contrasting this, as I said before, with the giving of the law, the written concept preceded the demonstration. And actually, it was the law was given at Mount Sinai, there in Exodus chapter 20. But there was no living demonstration until... Christ magnified the law and made it honorable. Amen. There was no living, not until that time. See, there, were, there had been a long time lapse until there was a demonstration. Now I want to establish a concept, a context for the hope of which we're speaking. And this is a, just a brief, a brief exposition of these uh, verses which I've just read. Now, just follow my reasoning here. We've got to see the, 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 the context in which Paul is speaking here in order to appreciate what he's talking about. Knowing the hope. He talks about when he heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now, these are the preeminent requirements in the New Covenant age. Now, when I say the New Covenant age, I don't mean the last 27 books of the Bible. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the age... When this covenant, the covenant that Jeremiah prophesied, which was in, introduced on the day of Pentecost, I'm talking about the time when that covenant was in effect. These are the preeminent requirements. requirements. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandments. See, there it is again, the two preeminent requirements. Now, how uniquely and blessedly dissimilar from the requirements of the first covenant. Amen. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man shall do, he shall live in them. Leviticus 18.5. Summary of the First Testament. In this age of great deception and division, it is extremely uncommon to find these two commodities, faith and love, in that which calls itself the church. Now that's a, an ir irony right there. I mean, they're supposed to be the, the place where you would expect to find it. Now when I, uh, let me clarify what I mean by faith and love, and we'll get, we'll get to hope. See, I, but this is the context. When I say faith, I'm talking about faith that is unvarnished, by earthly and sectarian pretensions. In the words of the Apostle, faith unfeigned. You know, there is a, uh, a Baptist-type varnish, and there's a Pentecostal-type varnish, 
And there's an assembly of God type varnish, and there's a church of Christ type varnish. Let's not. Let's. But I'm. I'm just saying. Uh, we, we're looking at. We're looking at faith unfeigned. Faith in the Son of God. And a love unto all the saints. What does that mean? This is a love for regeneration. This is a love for a new preachership. Amen. See, it's not just a love for the people that attend my church. That's not what that means. Now, we're talking about wherever you see the new birth. Wherever you see this manifested in man, the uh, new creature, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now, wherever you see that, that's, that's what we should be attracted to. With, and this amounts to the living Christ being in measure re-embodied in believing men through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And these are the identifying marks in, of genuineness in the New Covenant era. Now, wherever this faith and love are discovered, they should be a cause for thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Really should. And let us bless the God of heaven for unfeigned faith and love that are encountered wherever they are found, even if they don't come for our particular camp. Amen. Amen. The camp of the Lord is very great. Amen. Amen. Now, someone may ask, now, how do you do this? How do you, uh, how do you have this sort of uh, regard and attitude? Well, if you love newness and regeneracy, and if you despise oldness, in the sense that Paul talked about in Romans 7, you'll do the right thing. Amen. We don't need a list of rules. See, it's just we don't need a list of rules in this case here. Now he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This verse is very instructive and challenging. It challenges me about the uh, the manner of the kingdom. Now Paul, upon hearing of the brethren's faith and love, began making supplication. He did not make begin by applauding them. He could have said, now, good job, you brethren there at uh, Ephesus. Good job for all the faith and love that you've been manifesting. He could have given them a pat on the back. Or he could have boasted to some other churches. He could have told the brethren of Galatia or, or some of the other Thessalonica. He could have told them. He said, now, you ought to, you ought to know about uh, the faith and love that I've seen at, uh, over there at Ephesus. No, this was not his first response. He says... When I first when I, when I first learned of your faith and love, he says I began to make supplications. I, I didn't take it for granted. I didn't take this matter for granted. I I began to to seek the Father's face in this matter. His first thoughts of them were in connection with the hope, the heavenly calling the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and so he began making earnest supplication in their behalf. And I thought, may there be a widespread reinstatement of this type of spiritual resoluteness in our day. We want to, I don't mean that we should compile a list, that's not what I'm saying, but see, we want to have this type of sensitivity that whenever you see Whenever you see faith and love, see that this is just the, the starting point. See, wherever you see this, the genuine article, that's what I'm talking about. I don't mean the sham type thing, but whenever you see the real thing, wherever it is, give thanks. And and seek seek the Father's face for this individual that he may that he may come go to perfection. See, we want to bring these individuals, we want to bring them along all the way. We don't want to just leave them at the starting point. Now we can extract from these considerations the nature of the entrance into the world to come to which the hope of reference pertains. It is not unpremeditated and is also not of the sort to be casual or careless about. We that are in Christ have been called to inherit a blessing of its unspeakable magnitude 
And each man, woman, boy, and girl must make certain that they do not come short of it. Amen. Amen. Everyone must make their calling and election sure. Amen. Make it sure to themselves. Don't be afraid of that word election. And at the same time, apostles, prophets, elders, fathers and mothers will watch for the souls of those who are under their ministry and influence in order that they, the laborers, may not lose their reward. Amen. Amen. Now the spirit of wisdom and revelation. See, Lord, we're, we're getting up to the hope, but see, this is part of the context. We see here that the hope to which we are called could never be ascertained with man's wisdom. It could not be happened on scientifically. It is hidden from the eyes of the natural man. The natural Amen. man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Being spiritually and gifted and with the spirit of wisdom and revelation is essential to the comprehension of the hope of glory. Amen. We ask you, uh, have you been so engifted or was this only for the apostles, as some would say? Is this, uh, is this an exclusive gift or is this something for every generation? Well, I think if you just read the, the text, the, that question is answered. It's for every generation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is essentially a divinely bestowed gift and it's not something that is learned academically or methodically and not even by religious scholasticism, although we don't despise that altogether. This gift is for those who have cut anchor with flesh and the natural order and are in pursuit of the world to come. Amen. The world is not worthy of them and God is not ashamed to be called their God. Amen. They abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul and their anchor of hope is cast upward within the veil through which the forerunner is for us entered and they are at the present time raised up to sit together with God in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Amen. Now this gift comes through divinely ordained means such as the preaching and hearing of the word which are to be the salient and preponderant parts of the weekly assembly of the saints. Amen. Amen. But it does not come by man's natural contrivances. Amen. The spirit of wisdom and revelation, not by wisdom only, and not only by revelation. The divine imagery in man is summoned into involvement here, God not only reveals the nature of the hope set before us, but wisdom also, that of the illuminated mind, is called into activity here, canvassing, as it were, the promised heavenly inheritance in much the same way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sojourned in the land of promise. Amen. The spirit of wisdom and revelation can only be had by those whose hearts and minds are saturated with and in submission to the words of the Scripture. Amen. And we trust that you will be provoked to do some sanctified canvassing as a result of the meetings this week. Amen. Wisdom, in this case, carefully considers and joyfully interacts by faith with that which is re revealed of the glorious hope. The Father and the Son do not force that which they are revealing upon men. They rather impart the spirit of wisdom to hearts that are submissively inclined to them, that they may properly assess that which has been revealed and embrace it. In the knowledge of Him. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is not had in personal dissociation from the Father, but rather in the knowledge of Him. At every point, God has made room for Himself to be an integral part of the salvational enterprise. Amen. Amen. This illumination comes not merely by having faith that is professed, 
that is, by an intellectual acknowledgement of the things which are most surely believed among us, rather it comes by faith that is had in possession and is progressing and advancing in its apprehension of heavenly things. From faith to faith, or through faith in order to a greater faith, or seeing him that is invisible in order that he might be more clearly seen. Faith to faith. Now see, if you want a pattern theology, we've heard about that sometimes. See, here's the pattern. The pattern is from faith to faith. See, see and against such there is no law. <laughs> the hope of his calling. Let's look for a moment at the, uh, the promises to the overcomers in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3. We're not going to read this entire passage, but I want to just kind of skip over the, the high points here. Now, the, uh, the church of Eph at Ephesus, the promises of the, the tree of life is again made accessible. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Amen. Our first parents were cut off. See, you may think, some, some people, I trust none here, may think that this is like a matter of irrelevance. But our first parents were cut off from the tree of life. And we, in their stead, are cut off as well. By nature, we're cut off from the tree of life. But not in Christ. See, we've regained access in Christ. But I'm talking by nature. By nature, every, every boy and girl that's born into this world comes in cut off by nature from the tree of life. That doesn't mean that God won't accept them on, at a certain time. That's not what I'm saying. But by nature, see, they're, they come in to a heritage that's cut off from the tree of life. This was our state prior to being in Christ. Now the tree of life, so you want to see the, the, the wonder and the luster and the blessedness of this, of regaining the tree of life. See, this is, we don't want to take things, I know this, there's, there's a figure, he's speaking in a figure here, but, but nevertheless, this, you want this language to be attractive to our, our spirits. Amen. The tree of life speaks of the eternal sustainment of the new body. The absence of decay and corruption in, in any sense. And the tree of life, when properly contemplated, should be an inspirer of blessed hope. Amen. Thus, the tree of life, being made accessible, speaks of reconciliation to God from a condition of alienation, of lostness, of being cast out, it signifies also the unhibited knowledge of God being had in abundance. Whom to know is life. Amen. And the restoration of spiritual vision without the hindrance of the flesh and the fleshly mind. See, that's the ultimate. Amen. And then uh, Smyrna, here we have this promise of uh, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. See, this ought to be part of our concept of hope. Amen. See, uh, some of the brethren were talking about both aspects. See here, but see, this is a very, this is still a valid concept. See, I don't. If anybody thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Now, though it's highly unfashionable to speak on this wise in religious circles of the day about not being heard of the second death. Yet one of the primary elements of this hope bears on the fact that we shall be ever, forever delivered from the present domain where the second death yet has power. And where it has power to engender fear, power to eternally separate men from the God of heaven, and power to hurt. Yeah. And that's uh, speaking euphemistically, but that's, uh, that's the language of the of the scripture there, that shall not be hurt. And I'll tell you, that hurt is a big word. Amen. The facts in the case as they pertain to all men yet living in the flesh, in the body of, the, of this humiliation, or we'll strengthen this a little bit, the vile body, 
I don't see why we should soften it here, are this. The second death still has power to hurt, to mortally wound, and to inflict damage with finality upon all who are not presently living and walking by faith. You, uh, we speak about the vile body. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. But you know, this, uh, this vile body, see, this body does not cooperate with your desire to serve God. Amen. See, that makes it vile. This, bo this body, it's not, I, yeah, I know it's, it is humiliating. It is a body of humiliating. It's humiliating to be in this body, but in more senses than one. That's why it's vile, see. You, see, the, your body, see, your spirit says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to praise God. And your body says, no, I'm not. And you and you have you resolve that you're going to serve, you're going to do some type of service for God, and your body says, I'm not going. I'm not going with it. See, and you just have to beat it into subjection. Amen. You just have to you just have to make it follow. And and just make it do the will of God. See, but that's why it's a vile body. It's in, it's set in opposition to the uh, to the will of God. Just for the just for the time, not for long. Now we'll just we'll skip down. We won't touch on all of these things here. But I think of Thyatira here, and he said, uh, "I will give him the morning star." Yeah. Now Christ, uh, you know, remember Jesus said Himself later on, and uh, I believe in chapter twenty-two that He Himself is the morning star. You see, he is the uh, he is the beginning. He is, as far as illumination is concerned. See, he's the sun. He's the, he's the beginning. He's the first the first light that you see in the kingdom of God is Christ. And and every advancement of light is Christ. And then remember in Revelation chapter one, he talked about the sun shineth in his strength. See, so even the full orbed illumination. See, this this is Christ. See, he is the, this is Christ. He's, I am the light of the world. He still is the light of the world. Amen. Amen. We'll just go down here a little further to Philadelphia. We'll just bring this to a close pretty quick here. He talked about having a new name and being made a pillar in God's temple and going no more out. Somebody else uh, just touched on that. I won't uh, read the verse that you, I know you all know this, but uh, let me just comment on this a little bit. Being made a pillar. Now this is in contrast with the uncertainties of this life, see? No more uncertain, uncertainties. See, you're going to be a pillar there, not a pillar here. You might seem to be a pillar as James and, and Cephas. Many of you seem to be pillars. But see, we're still in the in the domain where things can be shaken. See, but but there, see, you'll actually be you will be a pillar if you overcome. See, and and remember, uh, the overcoming is by faith. See, this is not something that you try to muster up within yourself. But but see, the this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we're not talking about strapping you with a whole new set of requirements. No, no, we're just, this is, we're talking about the same thing we've been talking about all week. See, the overcomers are the ones that keep the faith and hope unto the end. Now, he said, you've got to get this, he said he's going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God, not just somewhere in the heavenly land. See, this is uh, this is close to the throne. See, this is this is where the pillarship is going to be. Amen. Now, going no more out, he says, they shall go no more out. And this is in contrast with the testings, the chastenings, the buffetings, the hardness, the persecutions, which are part and parcel of this life of the sinful body. Going out and being out for a season, in this sense is bearable, but not pleasant. He said, remember, Jesus says you shall go in and out, and you'll find, you can find pasture in both places. Now, it's best to be in, 
but you can still find pasture when you're, when you're out. See, now, pretty soon, we're all going to go out. See, there, there's a lot of different senses in which you can go out. See, this can be personal or it can be corporate, but, but see, in, in a very short time, this meeting will come to a close, and in a very real sense, all of us are going to go out. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to go out entirely from the presence of God, but we're going to go out from the, the blessedness that we've enjoyed while we were here. See? But that's only part of this life. See, that's not... They shall go no more out. Amen. Amen. And going out can just have to do, you know, it can be in this, you know what I mean, just sometimes that God's presence isn't as discernible as it is in other times. See, and that's a time of going out. But you also come back in. See, Amen. It, see it's not a, shouldn't be, don't, uh, don't be uh, reconciled to being out. See. Now he said uh, to the church at uh, Laodicea that they shall sit with me, sit with me in my throne, even as I am set down with my father in his throne. Now this is a very large subject to come to contemplate, and and we quite frankly don't have all the uh, answers to this, but uh, we can we know some things about this. Now think of this in contrast with being the tail. You ever think, uh, in so many instances in life, you know, and Moses there, he talked about being the, the tail and not the head. But see, there, you'll no more be the tail. See, there are a lot of life experiences, you end up being the tail. You ever notice that? You're not the head as much as you'd like to be. You're the tail a lot of times. But, but that's uh, only for the, for the present time. No more grapplings with the body of this death. No more vexations from the ungodly. No more evil communications to contend with. We'll exchange this vile body for one that is like unto Christ's glorious body. Now, knowing the hope, we're going to bring this to a close pretty soon, but uh, can be, we can think about this in at least two different senses. Now, one sense is simply knowing it in order to be able to identify the genuine article. And that's a valid, uh, see, that's a valid uh, sense. See, you, want to, you want to be, in other words, you want to be able to distinguish the hope that we're talking about from false hopes. So you want, to, you want this clearly solidified in your mind. You want to immediately be able to spot false hopes. Abstain, abstain from false hopes, brethren. And uh, so it's knowing the genuine article. And uh, you know, like one of the brethren just read this a little while ago, but uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. Well, that's a false hope. So, but sometimes, you know, you want, to, you want your spirit to be sensitized enough so that you're able to to discern, to see that immediately, and and, uh, and either abstain from it or instruct the person that's uh, caught up in it, and so that he may go on to perfection. Now I, I don't know if you, I'm sure that you've heard this uh, said. I, I've actually heard that this was actually a, a, right after I came into the kingdom. About 30, actually, it was 30 years ago yesterday when I was uh, baptized into Christ, but. But this was not short long after that. I heard somebody say that if it turns out that there is no heaven, it will have been worth being a Christian anyhow. I actually heard somebody say that. Now, but over the years, I've heard that repeated over and over again, so I know that they're, it's like a parrot type thing. You know, they're just, he's just imitating something that somebody else said. And that's one of the, the stupidest things I've ever heard, actually. Amen. Now, this is a satanic delusion of exchanging the promised future blessedness for the leeks and the onions and the garlic of the present time in the name of Christ. Amen. It amounts to having no hope. Amen. Well, we ought to call a spade a spade, right? Amen. It's no hope. And they're doing it in the name of Christ. Now, isn't that the, the strangest thing that you've ever heard? 
Now here, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but uh, I'm going to say this anyhow. The doctrine of soul sleeping is a doctrine of no hope. Amen. At least, it's not the living hope to Amen. which we've been called. Amen. Now, if it doesn't make any difference whether you go immediately to be with Christ at death or whether you're unconscious for a long period of time, well, I think that casts a question mark over the present relationship to Christ. See, that, see I think that just, it just, uh, either people haven't thought about it or they're just insensitive. They're, we'll, we'll, we'll speak charitably about it. Does Christ, who is our life, Amen. and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, we have a thus saith the Lord on this matter. We, well, we have several on that matter. <laughs> now, here's another thing. I, I, we don't hear this talked about very much in these circles, but I'm going to talk about it anyhow, just briefly. The AD 70 doctrine, I'm sure most of you have heard about this, is a modern day classic example of hopelessness and futility embodied in religious teaching. It is nothing more than the teaching of Hymenaeus and Philetus all over again, prophesying falsely to men and women in the latter part of the 20th century, teaching that the resurrection is past already, and as well the second coming of Christ and the judgment and everything else that we're taught to hope for in Scripture. And incidentally, the Apostle Paul did not have any kind words for people that held uh, these type of views. He, he was not charitable. Amen. And neither should we. Amen. Now, knowing, uh, it, there's another sense about knowing the hope, and that's as comprehending the nature and magnitude of that which is hoped for. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. And that which pertains to the hope of which we speak is the joyful sound of the new covenant era. Amen. Now let's talk about some of these things. Hope maketh not ashamed. Now I know this has been touched on, but I, I think you'll see that I, I'm coming at this from a little different angle than the ones that have mentioned it before. Hope does not disappoint those who have it in possession. They may meet with momentary disappointment because of things pertaining to this life, but this hope will not let you down, cast you down, or disappoint. Amen. Everyone who has this hope will ultimately have praise of God, Amen. and they will certainly not be put, ashamed, put to shame. Now hope, as we've said, hope has already been said, that is seen is not hope. Romans 8.24 now, if any man, anyone promise you, promises you earthly riches in the name of Christ, he's a liar. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you know, the Apostle John, you know, he's been uh, called the Apostle of Love. But you know, when it came down to this sort of thing, he called them liars. They're nothing but liars. They're deceivers. Amen. He, didn't have any, he didn't have any loving words for those kind of individuals. Not, not the corruptors of the faith. Amen. They're Amen. liars. The, ex, the expectation of the godly reaches into the next world where moth and rust Amen. doth not corrupt and where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life no longer try the hearts of the righteous. Amen. Hope is an anchor of the soul. Now, being overcome by perplexities, tribulations, and distresses is owing to a lack of future orientation. Amen. The age from the day of Pentecost to the end of the world is the time of heavenly orient orientation for men. Amen. Now, uh, Paul said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, we, we need to ask our question, now, is affliction working for us? See, we, let, let affliction be your servant. Let it work for you. Don't work for it. See, let it, let it work for you a far more exceeding... See, if you're overcome by it, then you're working for it. So, see, you can actually let it work for you, and it will actually carry you on to glory. Just let it work for you. It's just a matter of perspective. Let it be your servant. 
Now, hope often involves an intensive struggle. And we meant, we've read this already, but uh, against hope, Abraham believed in hope. Romans 4.18. Hope is of the nature that it conquers the seemingly insurmountable obstacles. It is able to na navigate in the spiritual strait of Magellan, where all things are possible to him that believeth. Hope does not always pilot in the balmy seas of life's pleasantries, Amen. where only some things are possible. It is able to maneuver in the choppy waters of distress, and through the menacing waves of affliction and testing where all things are possible. You remember there, uh, see, remember there in the psalm, he says, Thou, we came through fire and water, but thou broughtest us into a wealthy place. See, now God, God wants you to get, see, that's the, an interpretation of affliction. See, God gets you into this place where you're out in the wilderness, as it were, where he can, where he can bless you. Amen. Every man that hath this hope purifieth himself. 1 John 3, 3. A righteous expectation demands a righteous preparation. Amen. Amen. Hope has to do with the expectation of dwelling forever with the thrice holy God, with Christ the Holy One of God, and with all the holy angels, and with all the saints of all ages. Amen. And everyone who has this hope purges himself. He purges himself. He cleanses himself. See, in view of the, of the holiness, that of the land of holiness to which he goes. See, he's, he purges himself Amen. from all filthiness of the flesh. And this is done, of course, by the appointed means of believing the record which God has given of his Son. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's how you purge yourself. Now, hope will provoke inquire, inquiry from the ungodly. Someone's already read this, uh, 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. Every man and woman in Christ is a custodian of their godly expectation in the midst of a generation that is without hope. They have, they may have a name, the ungodly may have a name that is recognized here in the condemned order, but you, by grace, have one that is recognized in the eternal world. Amen. Amen. Do you ever think about your name being known over there? I think of uh, this, uh, this text in Daniel, the, uh, the, the angel Gabriel, he says, Oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Now, he was, he was not speaking just in behalf of himself. He was speaking in behalf of, 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 the, of the throne. He was speaking in behalf of heaven. Oh, Daniel. He saw, they saw that he, all heaven was looking down. All heaven was watching. Watching Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And, and oh, Daniel, you're a man that's greatly beloved. All heaven... Is there the affection of all heaven is turned toward you, Daniel. And do you ever think about that? That that same thing transpire can transpire in the new covenant age. Amen. Oh, Brother Wilson, a man greatly beloved. Not just by men. See, we want, we don't want to just look at the at the earthly perspective, see. We want to see the heavenly perspective. Amen. A man greatly beloved. And that can be said of everyone that's walking by faith. Amen. Amen. Brother Hoffman, a man greatly beloved. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Hope is nothing more than faith stretching forward to the future Amen. and embracing the promised heavenly inheritance. Amen. Hope is love in its affectionate bond to the world to come. Amen. See, love's involved there too. You can't have hope without having your affection involved. You think you can be cold and have hope? You've got to, you've got to have a, an, an inward attraction for these things. And that's what hope is. Faith Faith gives substance to things hoped for. 
It makes the promised benefits to be tangible and real to the heart of the believer. And hope is the result of tasting the heavenly gift. Amen. Now to be absent from the body it is to be present with the Lord. We mentioned that already, but a vital aspect of the hope of which we speak involves the possibility of being any at any moment present with Christ. Amen. Any moment. It's not just down the road you're going to be with Christ. No, no. See, at any moment, see, you, you have this, there's this possibility that, that remains for every, every man and woman and boy and girl that have obeyed the gospel. Of any moment, they could be in the presence of Christ. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if the earth, this earthly tabernacle were to suffer dissolution, we have, right now, a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Those possessed of their new bodies, or their building of God, have forgotten how to sing the lamentation and war anthems of Romans 7, and know only the blessed victory anthems of the eternal world. Amen. And they sing the song of Moses, and of the servant of God, and of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Amen. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Amen. Amen. The fight within them is over. They have beat their internal swords into plowshares and their internal spears into pruning hooks. The Apostle Paul did not affirm that when we are in the grave we're absent from the Lord. Now, he didn't say that. Amen. He said when we're in the body, we're absent from the Amen. Lord. Amen. Now here's another instance where it is a disadvantage to be at home. Did you ever think about that? See, we're at home in the body and it's a disadvantage. Remember Solomon, he said it's a disadvantage if you've got a brawling woman at home, right? And then... Uh, Jesus said that a uh, prophet is not without honor, save in his own house. Disadvantage, see that? Your own house can be a disadvantage. And here our own house is a disadvantage. But see, this is not our only home. Uh, Solomon, he taught there in Ecclesiastes, he says, well, man is going to his long home. See, this is only your short home. So you take consolation in that, brother. This is your short home, and you're very soon going to your long home. And in this case, the difference between long and short is as great as the measure between the east and the west. Amen. Natural life, not death, is the only impediment to fellowship with God. Amen. Amen. For those who are in Christ Jesus and whose sins are covered, and if it is the vile body that now stands in the way of the unencumbered enjoyment of God's presence, then what shall be the result of that body's demise but to greatly enhance that enjoyment? Amen. Now, he did, Paul didn't say, there in Romans 7, now he said, he didn't say, who shall deliver me from the death of this body? Did you ever think about that? Amen. Amen. Didn't say that. He said, he didn't say, who shall deliver me from the death? He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Big difference. The body itself was causing a momentary separation that was of heartbreaking consequence to the Apostle Paul. And I asked of what consequence is it to you? One, uh, one man said, uh, I don't remember the, all of this, but he said it in... Uh, part of this uh, was that it is a martyrdom to live from this perspective. Death, among other things, cannot separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, and if it could, would it not yet have a staying effect? I mean, if death could separate you, it would still have a sting. Amen. Now, Peter spoke of his exodus, not of his being cut off. And Paul, in another sense, in another place, he said, the time of my destruction is at hand. The time of my departure is at hand. Amen. Thank you, Brother Seth. 
That is his departure to be with Christ. And we could add that all, to all departures, there is a corresponding arrival. And in this case, it's in the world to come. There are no departures in this case that don't have an arrival that goes with them. Amen. Well, I'm going to bring this to a close pretty quick. Here. I believe it was one of the, uh, the Wesley boys that said, One thing would I know, how to make it to heaven, and how to land safely on that happy shore. Amen. And then, uh, in closing, I'd like to just read some three, uh, three texts of Scripture. One is uh, Psalms 32 and verse 19. This is the hope. And I want you to notice there's conditions here, but I want you to notice what the conditions are. The conditions are very much within reach. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for those that keep all the commandments perfectly. Is that what he said? No. He says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, for those which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Amen. See how that, see that just, you could, you could just step right into that. See, if you have a good and an honest heart, see, this is not something that you have to, that's, that's out here, that you have to grope for. See, that's, it's not of that nature. And his goodness, oh, how great is his goodness for them that fear him. And see, and, and fear, this kind of fear is just a matter of seeing God as he is. It's reverential fear. And then in, uh, there's another condition here, but see it's uh, in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee. Here's the mystery. There's the mystery that Paul spoke. See, God had, it was a mystery that God had. said, beside thee, which, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Amen. See that? Now, you can just step right into that, too. See, waiting. See, just, but see, this, it all this results from seeing God and, and just simply knowing God. Wait. The condition is waiting. It's not, keep, it's not keeping a whole set of commandments. It's, it's waiting for God. See, and the, and the goodness is, is laid up for those that are waiting for him. Anticipating him. Waiting. Anticipating Earnestly anticipating. And then one final one. Now this is where Paul actually quotes this same verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, and it was written back there in Isaiah 64, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Amen. Now see here, the, there the condition is love, love, loving God. See now, if you if you love God, if you have an affectionate affection for God, if you keep His command, Jesus said, "If you love me, keep my commandments." And this is His commandment that we believe on the name of His Son Jesus Christ and love one another Amen. as He gave us commandments. So you can step right into that. Condition to see. Amen. He said that that the see the oh I I have not it's unspeakable greatness unspeakable blessedness that's laid up for those that love God. Amen. That are waiting for God and that fear Him. See and I and I just uh, 